My mission at heart is to really inspire other people to take action for themselves. The only way that happens is by showing them respect and showing them that you care about their own development so that they can reach whatever goals that they want to achieve. This is wild because recently I had just recorded with Ty France, MLB All-Star. Dude's an absolute stud. And when he was in college, he was playing for Tony Gwynn, which he called him Coach Gwynn and didn't really realize until after he was being coached by Coach Gwynn who he was, how great he was at what he did, and just everything about his entire career. And I feel very similar about you, Coach B, being at Quinnipiac, and you're still there right now, calling you Coach B all this time. And then as I get older and as we all grow, continue to get better, just seeing you pop up left and right, it's like the way that Ty France felt about Coach Gwynn is how I feel about you, Coach B. You are just the man. I knew that you were the man, but you really are the man. So thanks for hopping on. Keep swinging, brother. That's amazing. Thanks for the intro and thanks for the warm welcome. Um, you know, it's it's been great to see your own career path from afar and, you know, getting to know you a little bit more. And it's, it's, it's amazing what you're doing. And I'm, ha- I'm just happy to be here. No, likewise. And I think anybody who listens to this entire podcast, because Keep Swinging, all about progression, all about a mindset that we both share about just getting better. They'll, a lot of things that I've learned from you, whether it's something that you've told me directly or a book that you've told me to read, there's it just stems a lot from your mindset. And dude, you've just had such an impressive career. I guess for any new listener, how would you best describe yourself? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I, so what I do on a day-to-day basis is, is I am a strength condition coach, athletic performance coach, human performance coach. Um, but how I would best describe myself is is really... Uh, a lifelong learner who's passionate about trying to help other people become the best versions of themselves. And so strength conditioning just happens to be my avenue uh, because like it, it's, it's my passion is training and exercise and, and it's kind of evolved over the, over my, my career. And as I've gotten older, but I realize that it's every single person has, has an opportunity to get better and uh, has an opportunity to learn and ha- has an opportunity to grow and I'm extremely passionate about that because I think if we all have that shared focus or shared goal of really trying to improve, it's amazing that the world that how much the world can get better and how much our communities can get better. And I know that's that's high aspirations and high goals, but I really believe and I see it is that if you have a group of people that truly believe that they can improve, then things are limitless. This is exactly why I want to have you on, because even though you are a coach inside of a weight room working with teams, all this stuff is relatable to life, not just athletics, which I'm going to read this off because I don't want to botch it because you said this so well and the the way that you articulate it was so on point, but it's, it's, it's keep swinging, it's get better, but this is what I always try to do every single time I bring an athlete on or somebody like yourself who I like to consider a game changer and a friend, but your whole mission is you want people to think about what they do, why they do it, and how the info that is presented to them can be implemented to them and enhance what they do and how they can improve what they do. So that's exactly what this is. So whether it's an MLB all-star coming on to keep swinging, whether it's somebody like Coach B, Rajesh Patel coming here, it's, it's how can you enhance what you're doing by the stories that are being shared here and and we're just lucky to have you right now just talking about this mindset because i guarantee you somebody who's listening to this at least one person is going to come out of this better well that's the thing is it's you know it's about trying to make an impact it's about trying to have influence and it's really trying to enlighten people that that they're they're in control of their own journeys like it's there's so many people, I think, just kind of like float on autopilot, right? They just kind of go through their day to day and they just kind of go through the motions. And and when you step back and you start to ask a question of like, why am I doing this? Why am I thinking this? Why am I, um, why am I feeling this way? And then getting them to realize that they're truly in control of how they feel and how they think. And when they can start to become and develop that awareness, right? I say that all the time. It's that self-awareness. And then you start to learn some self-management skills. Um, then you can really kind of navigate and direct how you feel, how you approach things um, and stop acting like victims and start being in, in control of everything that is that you want. Like if you want to feel happy, like that's, that's on you. Like you, you're choosing to feel a certain way, right? There's, I say this all the time is that there's two certain things in life, right? You're, you're gonna, we're all going to die. 
and we all have to make choices. And so once you accept the fact that we're all going to die, like that should impact the choices that you decide to make because we all hear the story, right? Like where when people are on their death, death their deathbed, they they start to have these they they let go of everything. You know what I mean? And they just start to experience life and they just start to um, enrich the the connections that they have with their family or other people because they don't want to have any regrets. Right. And so I think those are the types of things that really that really matters, like the choices you decide to make on a day to day basis. And by no means uh, do I want anybody to think like I'm perfect. I'm not perfect. Like I am making my my own mistakes and I'm learning constantly, but I'm choosing to learn and I'm choosing to to look at things from multiple lenses and multiple vantage points so that I can, number one, uh, you know, try to make my, improve my decision making skills but also try to deepen the connections that I have with those around me. And a big choice that you made for yourself, going back to when you were a kid, growing up, uh, your parents worked multiple jobs to support you. You were an only child. And something that happened to you was uh, you were doing football drills and you finished last in every single category. And at the time you said that, that you were not as in good a physical shape as you would have liked to have been. But right there, you had a choice. You could either continue that path or change it and do something about it. And you did something about it. And then you eventually got into this field at your senior year of high school, which you're still into this day. But just that one choice back then has allowed you to gain all this experience and all this stuff that you said evolves over time. So you've just been kind of just like you said, by no means perfect, but just kind of like a fountain of knowledge um, that you've had. It's just been like such a wild ride. But yeah, the football drills and everything back then, like you knew that you wanted to step into this field ever since then. Well, it was, it was more so like I was always over, overweight as a child and, and it is because my parents worked as an only child. I wasn't able to play a lot of youth sports because financially we just couldn't afford it. Timing wise, my parents were always working. So I found myself sitting on the couch a lot, eating snacks and junk food and, and just watching TV. And, you know, there was, there was a time when a lot of my family would say, Hey, you need to, you need to lose weight. You need to do this. You need to exercise. And, and you know, I kind of dismissed it and nothing ever clicked. I never had that spark until, and I always loved athletics and I loved sports and I'd play recreational with friends and things like that. But it, it did like it clicked in high school when, you know, i made a choice. I'm like, I don't want to finish last anymore. Like, I don't want to be the kid that everybody kind of pities and claps for to like finish their run. Like it didn't make me feel good. And it was, I made a choice. I'm like, you know what? Like I want to play. Um, I want to improve my conditioning. I don't want to be last. And it was then that everything kind of just changed for me. And it was, it was that spark, you know, like everybody has their spark or has their moment of clarity or has their, their moment. And for me, like, I, I know I'm not, uh, I'm not normal. Like I was 14 years old when that happened. I was 14 years old and, and everything kind of set my, my, my life on this path of, of making myself better. But then also realizing that we all have that power and we all have that that control within ourselves to be able to do whatever it is that we want to do. Yes. And right there. So it, it, we're talking about how you can make this choice and having the power to do whatever you want to do. Making a choice, yes or no, is the first thing. Taking that action is the second thing. So once you got to UConn, it was the second week that you were ever there that you decided to volunteer with the athletic department. So a lot of a lot of people, I mean, two weeks in, maybe even all freshman year, some people all four years, they're just going to college to party. But you hopped on campus and you took action right away. You didn't have to. And one of the first teams that you worked with, what it's not like it was the UConn basketball team, all uh shiny uh new car, or whatever, some of that everybody wants. It was it was, I believe it was the track and field team. Uh correct me if I'm wrong, but like, dude, th that's the second thing. You choose and then you take action. Yeah, it was um it all kind of started like I, when I was in high school, like looking at potential careers and things that I want to study. And I made the decision, like, you know what? Like, I love athletics. I love exercise. I like nutrition. I like training. I knew I wasn't going to be a division one athlete. And so I kind of made a choice. Let me help other people try to reach their own dreams and reach their goals, their athletic goals. And so I realized when I found out that strength and conditioning was a career, this was like 1997 or 1998. Like I, I made the choice. I'm like, you know what? Like, I want to be a strength conditioning coach. And I remember telling my parents and they, the first question that they asked me, they're like, they're like, can you support a family doing that? You know, and, and it was almost like, you know what? I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to make it work. Like, I'm going to get it done. Like, 
don't you worry. And almost like to prove them wrong, you know what I mean? Because there's not a lot of people within Indian culture that turn out to go into sports, number one, and become a coach. So I wanted to be not like I had the goal of being a trailblazer or like setting, setting the, setting the standard for what's, what's possible. I just, it, it was my passion and what I wanted to do. And when I got to school, I, uh, you know, I saw a flyer up in the gym. It's, you know, it was with Andrew Hootie and she's now back at UConn. She took some, uh, she worked at Kansas and so it was at Texas, but anyway, um, you know, she was doing like a lit in service for any students about like some, some exercises. And so I remember I went to it and I asked her, I said, Hey, I want to do what you do. What do I need to do? And, and she told me, she's like, Hey, you got to just go down the varsity weight room. And she told me where it was and meet with coach Martin. And I remember, you know, I, I took those steps and I had that meeting and I was intimidated and, uh, and he's, you know, he asked me a bunch of questions and I said, all right, he said, he's like, all right, we'll be in touch. And I remember getting a phone call, right? This is when there was no cell phones and my, my dorm room, my dorm room phone call uh, rang and it was from Sean Wendell. He was a graduate assistant at that time. He's now with the Indian Pacers, but he called me. He's like, Hey, do you want to, uh, you want to help me out with track and field? I said, yes, yeah, sure. And I remember I went down and, and I just watched, right. I observed. And then I got asked questions. And if I didn't know the answers to those questions, they told me, all right, go look it up and come back. And, and I did. And I think they were probably testing me and quizzing me at that point of like how committed I really was towards uh, learning the career and becoming a professional strength conditioning coach. And I, and I didn't stop. And I just kept coming back and I kept coming back. And I remember I bought books from the library and, and you know, I just kind of immersed myself into learning. The internet was just kind of like really getting going at that time. So I remember going to the to the computer labs and looking things up on, on Microsoft Explorer. There was a browser that we had at that time and just like looking stuff up. And it was, um, it just kind of started from that point. Like it was my own choice to, to reach out and connect. And it was continued to be my choice to, to show up. And it was continued to be my choice to look up information and immerse myself in it. And, you know, the, and they saw that and they, they kept giving me more and more responsibilities and those responsibilities led to increased confidence. And that increased confidence led me towards asking more questions and volunteering at other places and doing internships and all these types of things. And, you know, it kind of took over my life. And again, like, I'm going to say again, I'm not normal. Like it, it was, uh, it was decisions and actions. And I realized, you know what, like uh, I, my, I'm going to let my social life suffer just a little bit or take a seat, take a step back because I needed the, the varsity athletes to, to respect me. And I couldn't, and I knew that if I was going out to bars and, and partying it up, like, and they saw me in the weight room that they might not listen to me as effectively. So I made sure like, you know what, like it was a Friday, Saturday night, whatever it was, like I, I would just chill. I'd read, I'd, you know, keep, keep a low profile. I would, you know, kind of stay in my room and do my own thing. And because I lived on floors like with football players and I'd have to coach them up in the weight room. I saw these kids in the cafeteria. I saw them everywhere. I saw them everywhere on campus. And, um, you know, it, all those things, I think, earned me a lot of credibility, earned me respect. And I knew that because by the time I was a senior, um, Sean had left to take a job at Rutgers and, and the staff was in a pinch and they're like, hey, can you cover some teams? And I'm like, this was 2001. Like this never happens in this day and age. Like I was certified, I was a cert certified strength conditioning specialist, but they they asked me, they're like, hey, can you cover baseball and track and field until we hire full time? I'm like, hell yeah. I'm like, I'll, I'll do that in a heartbeat. So I was the strength conditioning coach for UConn baseball and I was a student. <laughs> like I was a senior. Like I had class with a lot of these kids and I could be in class with them, but then when it was time to train, like they were completely locked in and, and they respected what I had to say and what I did for them. And um, it's because I showed value in them and I, and I cared, I truly cared about their own development. And that's always, you know, my mission at heart is to really inspire other people to take action for themselves. And the only way that happens is by, by showing them respect and showing them that you that you care about their own development so that they can reach whatever goals that they want to achieve. And um, it was it was it was really cool. Like if I can take a step back and look at those moments when 
you know, and I have kids in class and at the same time, and, and then I could be hard on them, like in a training session and they would actually listen to me. Like it was, it was really cool. And it just kind of built my, my confidence within my coaching ability. And, and, um, and it just, it was a springboard to everything else that's, that's going to happen to me, but I have a lot, I owe a lot to the staff when I was at the university of Connecticut. Um, they are legends in them, their own selves. Like I, I, I look back at it and I said, like, I was there during a golden age, like, uh, the head transition coach at that time, Coach Martin, was a, was a legend. Rest in peace. He's no longer alive, but he was a legend in in the strength conditioning industry. Andrew Hooty is one of the most recognized uh, basketball strength conditioning coaches, and she works with UConn women's basketball now. But she had some stints at Kansas, won multiple national championships. Um, Tina Murray, who's now with the the university, the sorry, the Pittsburgh Penguins, but she's been at Louisville, the Sacramento Kings, uh, just just. A very respected strength conditioning coach in her own right. Uh, Sean Wendell's with the Indiana Pacers, the longest tenured NBA strength coach out there. Um, you know, just friends and kids I went to class with, they're still in the field and they're making a difference. And it's, um, you know, I was really fortunate to be at, at the University of Connecticut or be at the right place at the right time. There's three takeaways that I got from everything that you just said, because everything was so awesome. The first one is how well connected that you are, because you mentioned a lot of these individuals who went on to do huge things and are still doing it. Some, most of them. Um, so you're very well connected. So at that time, when you were at UConn as a freshman, you're planting all these seeds left and right. And now you have a jungle. You've connected me with some people, whether it's Jim McLeod over at MLB. I walk into NBA locker rooms and somebody knows you. Uh, I mean, even you got a chance to work with our boy, Scott Burrell while at Quinnipiac, uh, he was an NBA champion. And then I walk into MLB clubhouses and you know Matt Blake, you know Eric Cressy, both guys who work with the New York Yankees. Everybody loves Eric Cressy and Eric's the man. And then when you think about, well, you talk to Eric and then he speaks so highly of you and what he learned from you, you're doing for them what the UConn legends who you just said did for you. So it's cool how you've been passing along. The second thing is you talk about having confidence, right? And the clarity that you had. So I heard John Gordon, who's one of the best authors in the self-betterment uh, field, and you actually put me on to him with uh, reading The Carpenter back, it must've been like 10 years ago or something. But something that he said recently was clarity equals confidence equals courage. So you get clarity, then that adds to your confidence, and then you have the courage to do all these different things. The third one I got, which was you talked about how you'd be in the cafeteria and you'd see some of the players who you'd be training or you'd uh, be at home on a Friday and Saturday night, uh, not going out because if you saw these people, you want to earn the respect and the credibility. Something that you live by is you got to live what you teach or you got to live what you, what you say and what you do. You can't be eating double cheeseburgers and somebody from the basketball team comes through and says, Coach B, <laughs> what are you doing, dude? You know? Um, so that talks and goes into leadership, which you've been a great leader. You, you've built Quinnipiac's program from absolutely nothing in the strength and conditioning field to what it is right now. You've led so many people. I mean, I, I remember I posted something on Instagram not long ago and, uh, somebody who had lived in my building, uh, Carl at upper deck athletics in Connecticut, he was like, Oh man, you know, Bridget Patel, Becca, when she was doing the strength and conditioning course, yeah. uh, you had popped up on screen and that was one of the days where I said to Becca, I was like, I want to learn something that's completely different, but I just want to get better using your mindset. And the next thing I know you're popping up on the, on the screen. And this is something about completely different. It's not sports, it's not media, it's nothing, but just trying to get better. So that when you talk about leadership, what are, what are some of your biggest things when it comes to leadership? Yeah, I think, um, I think what it comes down to is understanding what leadership is. And, and this is the way I believe and the way I think about it is that leadership is the ability to positively influence others to do what they didn't think they, they could do on their own. So I repeat that again. Leadership is the ability to positively influence others to do what they didn't think that they could do on their own. And so a lot of people will always talk about like, oh, I lead by example. And to me, you're just doing what you're supposed to do if you think you're leading by example. 
like if you're on a team or you're in a like a, a team at work or, or in your business, whatever you're doing, and if you just do what you're supposed to do, are you really leading anybody else? You know what I mean? Like to me, to me, you have to you have to be able to positively influence others to do what they didn't think they could do on their own. And so maybe that's encouraging, hey, come with me. Like, I'm going to go get some extra shots up. You come with me. Or I'm going to go go for a run. Come with me, right? Instead of just saying, follow me, I'm going to say, come with me. So that's positive influence right, right there for me. You know what I mean? Like, that's leadership in my mind. And others might think that leading by example is like a demonstrating leadership. And maybe it is. Like, But to me, in a team setting, if I see somebody come in and like Coach B, like, can I work on this? Like, can I get some extra work on this? I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, sure. Did you ask anybody to come with you? And and they're like, no. I'm like, well, like encourage somebody else to come with you, right? Like show them what you're doing to get better. Because then at some point that person's going to graduate, that person's going to leave. And then that person can pay it forward to somebody else. Like that's leadership. I'm getting the chills as you're saying this, because I'm I'm thinking about inside of your weight room. It was you were there, and it was uh, Coach Burrell was there, uh, and Cags were working out. Yeah, and I was by far the least athletic, the least in shape of of any of them. But I'm looking over to my right, and I'm seeing Burrell on the bike, just sweating his butt off. This dude already won his NBA title. He's played in in the league. Like he has nothing to prove. Then I'm looking at Cags throwing the medicine ball. I'm like, damn, that's one str- strong dude. But like you said, come with me. Come to the gym. They had you sent out the invite. Come to the gym. Come get a workout in. You can work out in this gym. And as I'm in there, I'm looking at everybody and I'm like, damn, I'm not where they are, but I know that I can get to where they are and I want to be where they are. So I'm going to watch and look at what they do and I'm going to slowly get there. And like you said, graduate. And eventually I got <laughs> I kid around with Becca all the time because she, <laughs> she always says these jokes because uh, that had to have been the best shape that I was ever in, in my life. But that was something that I learned inside of your gym was that come with me, that graduate, that that just continue to to progress, even though you I mean, everybody starts at zero. But uh, yeah, so that 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 role of leadership, like you said, with the come with me thing is uh, is so true. And I got to experience that firsthand. Yeah, and I think um, it's you know, there's different ways that people will lead like where um, you can lead by influence or you can lead by incentivizing. Right. And if we look at any kind of research into motivation, re- motivation through extrin- ex- mo- extrinsic motivation and motivation by through incentives only lasts for so long. Like the way that you're really going to increase somebody's motivation is you got to try to find what makes them tick on the inside. You got to try to find their fire. You got to try to find their spark. You got to try to find their passion within. Because intrinsic motivation is is what really is going to allow you to continue to pursue things, right? It's that passion, perseverance, or grit, like what Angela Duckworth would say. Um, you've got to be able to find that intrinsic motivation within somebody, and that's the power of influence. Like, um, I don't know if you've you've ever looked into this, but there's um, a great book by Daniel Pink. It's called Drive, and he talks about like uh, uh, different phases of motivation like your first instinct of motivation was survival right like we're going back like old times and then it kind of evolved into being extrinsically motivated by bonuses or by rewards or by um, monetary gains or like you know a championship or something like that like that only lasts for so long because they and then they found that the most valuable form of motivation was intrinsic motivation he kind of he, in the book he calls it intrinsic Motivation 3.0, where it's really trying to find things that, that you're passionate about. And they, they, they looked into what, um, I think it's Google. I think Google does this and they, they call this um, a FedEx day, right? So they let and people work on whatever it is that they want to work on because they're passionate about it, right? When you're passionate about something, you're going to put that much more purpose behind it. And so they found that they would work on these things, these passion projects, and then they'd have to present it and they'd call it FedEx Day because they have to deliver and they'd have to deliver on it. And what Google's done is they've been able to take ideas that people have had, their employees have had, and create products with it. Because, you know, like there's so many people that you probably know that like they'll, they, they go to work, they check the box, they're not passionate about it. They say my job sucks, like, and they're just being negative. But, but it, 
but it, it pays the bills and it does whatever it needs to do, then what do they do on the weekends? They do things that they're passionate about. They find hobbies. They they do you know little side hustles, whatever it may be, because that's what they really are passionate about. And so leadership is, in my opinion, is trying to find that spark within other people to help them create that intrinsic motivation so that they can accomplish whatever it is that they want to accomplish. And if you can make a career out of it, even better. You actually had that up on the board one time on the whiteboard, which was uh, all about the motivations and it was character versus emotionally driven. And I remember just staring at it, just really thinking so deep. I probably just looked like a statue staring at the wall, but I was like, damn, these are some really good points, but it's, it's everything that you just said. So for anybody who's listening to this and watching this, whether, like you said, whether you're working a nine to five or you're an athlete or I don't know, you're in college and you're trying to figure out what it is that you want to do. What would you say to them in, in terms of trying to dig deep and find that spark about what they really love, whether it's a hobby or a skill that they have that they can turn into a, a profession or a career? I think a lot of it comes down to the ability to look inward, right? And, and how you identify yourself. And I think the, the best example I can probably give give somebody is that a lot of people at the beginning of the new year, like they set, they set goals for themselves. They say, oh, well, I'm going to work out every day. I need to get in shape. And what I would say is if you're looking to get shape or you're trying to create health for your life, it's not something that you do. It's something that you are. Right. And so being able to identify yourself as like somebody who values health. So if you value health and you identify yourself as somebody being healthy, then you're going to take steps and actions that drive health. Right. Does that make sense? Big time. Yeah. So so I think a lot of people think about things that they do instead of realizing that it's not what you do. It's about who you are and what you value. And that only comes down to really identifying yourself, but it also it take it comes back to having a self awareness to understand what it is that you value, what it is that you want to become, what it is that's that you're truly passionate about, and that's hard for a lot of people to do, right? Like the ability to reflect, take a step back, absorb, modify, and apply, like the what you gain from reflection is really difficult. And sometimes you need coaching. Sometimes you need mentoring. Sometimes you need people around you to help you gain different perspectives. Right. And so like, it's like the toolbox analogy that I think everybody uses, right? If you, if you only have a hammer in your toolbox, you're going to view everything as a nail, but sometimes you need to have an, an Allen wrench or you need to use uh, pliers or you need to use, um, you know, a, a Phillips head screwdriver, whatever it may be, right? Like, so the multiple tools that you have in your toolbox can also be equated to like the lenses that you have or how you view things and the perspectives that you have. The more tools you have, the more lenses you have, the greater depth of understanding you can have. And then the greater depth of understanding you have, then you can be able to make a little bit more effective decisions towards whatever it is that, that's going to be, in, that's going to be presented in front of you. And, um, and just like we were talking about before, like, you know, I, I, I value my health. Um, so I'm going to exercise every single day. Like I'm going to carve out time every single day because I value the way I move and I value the way I feel. And in turn, that means that I, I if I know if I've got a busy day ahead of me the next day, whether it be kids sports or work, whatever it is, I'm going to go to bed a little bit earlier because I need to make sure not need. I want, I want to make sure that I get time to exercise because I know that's going to make me feel better. And I know when I feel better, uh, I can be better for other people. So a lot of it comes down to, uh, like I said before, is making sure you know who you are and what it is that you want to accomplish. So then you can you can kind of create your life around those things. Yeah. And like you said, that doesn't happen overnight. You know, uh, getting that self-awareness, it, it, it takes time, you know, and you've been in this situation where working at a division one program, using this as an example, where you've had the opportunity to get to teach a lot of kids and, and inside and outside of the weight room who you get to see that progression from when they were a freshman to a senior, you get to see them graduate those levels. And there's some people it's let's use Devon Tays, right? Unbelievable hockey player, defenseman at the time of this recording for the Colorado Avalanche, 
wore the A on his chest, the assistant captain, after the team had just won the Stanley Cup. So he's literally having such a great career, probably one of the best ever at a Quinnipiac. But when you think about him as a freshman to a senior to right now, graduating to assistant captain at times during the season, you've seen that firsthand, what it's like, just just developing that self-awareness, developing what you want to be. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people, when they're freshmen in college, they want to be a professional hockey player. Maybe they don't, or maybe they just work hard. And next thing you know, that opportunity presents it to himself. But like kind of using him as an example, just kind of talk about leading him. And uh, and again, like you said, deciding what you want to do and, and eventually making those decisions to be better rather than like kind of just going through the emotion mo- and, and airmailing it in. Yeah. Uh, Devon has become a, a, a very good friend. We, you know, we text regularly and his journey is no different than a lot of other student athletes that I've, I've, I've been able to work with and fortunate to be able to work with throughout my career. He's just had probably the greatest amount of success, like you mentioned at the professional level, regardless of sport, like in it's, it's um it's impressive to be able to see what he's done, but also all the other student athletes that have that have been able to work with um use what they learned within the weight room to be able to apply to their daily lives. And so we had some former women's basketball players come back and they flat out said they're like the discipline that I learned in the weight room has directly impacted to my discipline as a professional, right? And so Devon's a professional athlete, but everybody else is going to become a professional in some setting, whether it be a hospital or them being a coach themselves or them being a teacher or them being um, a business person, like whatever it is, it's, you're going to be a professional at something, right? And it's being able to learn the discipline, being able to learn the uh, the accountability, the respect, the work ethic kind of got like kind of comes back to like what my non-negotiables are. It's um it's impressive to be able to see those things. And in Devon being able to see the transformation from somebody who may not have really embraced the training process or embraced the being coached hard or being um being told that he can get better to see where he right now, where he has a thirst for it. Like he'll ask like, you know, what books, what books are you reading? What books should I read? Like what, what, what else can I get better at? Like just this past week, he asked, you know, it's like two books that I kind of recently recommended that he's enjoyed is, you know, Chop Wood, Carry Water. And then The Sale by John Gordon. He asked like, you know, which one in your opinion applies to athletes more? You know, and this is a guy who is, you know, arguably one of the top 10 defensemen in, in the NHL asking which book is more effective for athletes or w- asking which book you know, or translates better. And he would have never asked that as a freshman. It just says like a lot of freshmen, they, they think that, you know, they come from these, you know, a place where they're often the best and they're often able to maybe get away with some things because they are the best or they're the, the most talented. And the beauty of what I do in the way I look at what I do is that I don't control playing time. There is no depth chart within a weight room, you know? And when I have that mindset or that clarity, I can coach everybody the same. So the standards are the same. The non-negotiables are the same. Uh, the big things that I value are going to be the same. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. They're going to be the same. Right. And so, and when they're the same, I think every student athlete can say this, like they understand that I'm consistent, right? And then when I'm consistent in my approach, they know what they're going to get from me, right? It's it's different of being like, of having emotion versus being emotional. Like I can, that's emotional management, right? Like I, I can control my emotions. I can control my consistencies because they know that I'm going to be the same regardless. Like I'm going to care about them, but I'm going to coach them hard at the same time if they don't do what they're supposed to do to the level that I think that they can do it at. Um, yep. because I, I want them to understand, like, you can get better. Like, just cause you're here right now, doesn't mean that you, you, you can't get better. And so I want them to understand that they can, they have that ability to grow. They have that ability to learn. They have that go- the ability to improve and having that mindset. I know, like, I I'm firm on this, like it will translate into other areas of your life, right? It's, it's, 
it's habits, right? That's what we're really trying to go after is we're trying to build championship level habits, right? And so I'm going to say championship level, like championship, like, because we, we aspire to win, but it's not always about the outcome, but it's about the process of trying to get them to understand the small, simple steps that you take away are going to add up into massive changes athletically, physically, mentally, spiritually, and then even, like we said before, professionally. Yep. And I, everything that you said about Devon was so spot on and it's such a good example. And and anybody who's listening to this, it's it's like, think about Devon's story and what Coach B was just saying right now and, and how it could relate to you, you know, or, or what you're doing or what you can be doing. Because again, everybody starts at zero. But uh, yeah, I got a couple of these books right here that uh, Cags had, had, you told Cags about uh, the carpenter and then Cags gave me the carpenter, which then I gave to Chris Archer. Uh, big league no pitcher. Yeah. Yeah. Cause he, he loves books. So then he ended up reading it. So I actually got another one recently, <laughs> a second copy, but yeah, all these books, I don't even read guys. So everybody at home, like this is how good these books are. Uh, but the, the one with John Wooden, Wooden, coach Wooden, I don't remember buying this one, but I must've been in some sort of mood. The obstacle is the way. That is a great book. Ryan holiday is an unbelievable author. Yeah, see, that's why I bought it because you told me. But I, I, I'm being honest. I got to read it. <laughs> Hopefully, by the time this releases, I'll read it. But yeah, and then uh, John Gordon, Energy Bust, right here, the training camp. Yeah. Uh, so it's like all these books, chop wood, carry water. I had been messaging back and forth with, with Drew over at Meta Athletes, and and also yep. Devon too about how good that book is. And it's crazy too because there's a player who actually uh, who who wrote something on the back of it, like a quick little review. Nick Ahmed, professional big leaguer who one of my buddies, oh, yeah. Chris Griffin, played uh, summer ball with in college. And uh, I had been mes- messaging back and forth with Nick Ahmed. He went to UConn, didn't he? Yeah, he was a UConn guy. Went to, yeah, yeah, played baseball there. There, there yeah, you go. Drafted awesome. pretty high, too. So it's like it's like you have all these guys that are all interconnected. And, and another thing that I want to point out, too, like you said, when it comes to leadership, right? Like you can have an athlete, and there's so many things that they learn. And we'll take our good friend, Steve Robinson. Steve's the man. When he graduated Love college... Steve. It was like, all right, I'm an athlete. I don't have any work experience. How am I going to get a job? Not like, how am I going to get a job? But like when you apply for these uh, uh, jobs, they want to see what's on your resume, right? Well, Steve, and this is what he said, and this, well, this is what we talked about, and this is pretty much exactly what you just said. You're a team player. You know discipline. You know how to work hard. You know that if there's something in front of you, you are going to tackle it because that's what you've done during your four years at college. So for anybody listening to this also who may be an athlete uh, and thinks that they're just kind of one dimensional, what would you kind of say to them in that leadership role? Because there's probably going to be a lot of people who you speak to moving forward who are sitting there who's maybe they're just a salesperson or maybe they're just a doctor and they think that that's the lane that they have to stay in. But like, what would you say to them on that kind of leadership uh, stance? Yeah, that's a great question. And and like I know I said before, a lot of it comes down to how, how you identify yourself. And there are a lot of people that identify themselves simply as I'm a basketball player. I'm a baseball player. I'm a, I'm a hockey player. I, uh, this is me. And when you think, when you can take a step back from identifying yourself as that, and you can start to look back at the things that the sports have allowed you to learn, then you're going to start to realize like I'm a leader or I'm a, I'm a worker or I'm a, uh, I'm a great teammate. Like, and you can start to look back and really anchor yourself on the things that, that you're really good at instead of just understanding the things that you may define yourself as, as an athlete, because that's like, like you're one dimensional, right? Like you never want to think of yourself as one dimensional. Like, it's almost like, uh, you kind of want to be a generalist in a, in a, in a way, like where you, we can understand and identify yourself that, that you're good at like all these things. You may not be an expert at it, but like you've taken all these small steps that you've invested in over the time of your, your athletic career. And you've gotten better at these general qualities that really will translate to anything that you want to do. So if you're a basketball player and then you eventually want to become a teacher, you're going to understand like, Hey, I was, I was good at time management. I was good at, um, uh, of being a team player. I was good at, you know, doing, you know, showing up on time. I was good at showing respect. I was good at making sure that I could, um, you know, be respectful to everybody, those, those around me, because I, 
because I did something that was bigger than myself. And it comes down to just identifying yourself as, is realizing that you're not one dimensional. And if you put yourself in a box, you're always going to stay in that box, but try to look back and take a step back. Like what are the things that you've learned? What are the things that you've gained through these experiences that the, the athletics and sports has, has given you. And if you can understand like the things that you've yet you've done and the things that you're actually really talented at, you're good at, then you can apply that to anything. And it's, it's, it's almost like the, it's the mindset, right? So having that mindset of, of, are you like a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset? Like this is by Carol Dweck, but um, if you view yourself as a, having a fixed mindset, that means you, you're limited, right? That you're limiting your potential. This is uh, some examples are like, this is smart as I'm going to be. I'm never going to learn that. I'm never going to get better. I'm not going to improve my shooting percentage. I'm not going to, I'm not going to get that job because you're fixed. You have a fixed mindset. And you think that your potential is limited. Whereas if you have a growth mindset, you believe that your potential is limitless because you can grow, you can learn, you can expand, you can improve. And when you have that attitude and mindset that you can continuously improve, you're going to look back at your past experiences and recognize errors that you can improve, recognize things that you did really well and apply that to whatever task that you did is going to be moving forward. So a lot of it comes down to uh, you know, like how you identify yourself and really being able to understand that, that your limit, that your potential is really limitless. So like you're, you're only limiting yourself. I was just talking to Andrew McCutcheon about this the other day. The dude's 10 years in the big leagues plus won an MVP gold glove, all-star a bunch of times. And that's exactly what he said. He's just always had this growth mindset and that's, what's been able to keep him going over those 10 years. So even though kind of like what you're saying about Devon, that you're in the the highest league of whatever you're in, or you're in the highest job position, whatever you're in, just having that growth mindset rather than that fixed mindset allows you to continue to grow and continue to have that consistency in doing whatever it is that you're doing. So I couldn't agree with you more on that front. And one thing that I, that I do want to ask, because as a leader, you're talking to a room of a bunch of different personalities. Uh, we see it in clubhouses, locker rooms, offices, everywhere. Inside of homes, you have five people in your family. Well, or four, however many you have, three. Not everybody goes on the same like wavelengths, energy vibes, whatever. I mean, I guess for us, uh, when <laughs> like our girls, they're not big into the high fives, but but we are. Like we know that there's some benefits there with the the dopamine hits and the the the, the team chemistry, you know. Um, but again, not everybody's like that. Rightfully so. Not everybody's going to be ruhaha. Not everybody's going to be like, let's go out there and kill them. So <laughs> how do you kind of match those tones of the people who you're talking to when you are trying to lead a group? That's a that's a good one. Um, I Dude, just... I'm bringing out everything, man. I've been I, oh, I told you, man, I've been wanting to record since the very beginning of Keep Swinging. But because there's so many different things that I want to talk about. And also too, another thing to your point is I understand that season one of Keep Swing is completely different than season two. It's going to be completely different than season three, even though the same general type of thing, but there's going to be things over time that get better. Um, so I, I, yeah, I want to make sure that I, that I came correct for you, but yeah. Yeah. Like I, I, you and I, I think are wired very, very similarly where we're very positive. We, we approach things, we view things with a very positive outlook where excited about doing things we're very enthusiastic about things and you got to recognize that not everybody's wired that way and that it's not normal for everybody to 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 act that way or to think that way um it, it it's i think it, it's really as i've gotten older and if you can kind of define things like it's i think it's having this emotional intelligence i don't know if you, that's a term you've ever heard or, or anything like that but it's um it's one of the things like where as a leader, like you have to understand different emotional sides and different aspects of the emotions of the people around you, right? And for people to want to believe in you and understand understand you, there needs to be some kind of basic rapport and emotional understanding. And a lot of that comes down to obviously number one, you gotta know yourself, like know yourself as a leader. Like you gotta be able to manage yourself to effectively manage and lead other people. And so a lot of it comes down to self-awareness, right? Self-management, um, being socially aware, and then having social skills. 
like being able to understand, like, like I said before, like not everybody's going to think the same exact way as, as we do. Not everybody's going to act the same way that we do, but to be an effective leader, like you have to be able to understand that. And that was a question that you asked. I'm not answering yet, but where, like, how do I, how do I effectively communicate that to other people or how can I be aware of other people? Like a lot of it comes down to uh, empathy, like really being empathetic about other people. And that's probably something that I'm continuously working on. I'm not, not an expert at it, but trying to put yourself in their shoes or understanding how they view things. I was actually talking to an athlete about this um, last week is I can't tell them how I saw things like when I was 19 years old or I was their age. Like I can't say, you know what, when I was 19, this is what I did. Like, cause it's not going to work for them because they're not going to relate to me. They're not going to know what that feels like. And why should they? I need to be able to effectively look at the world around them as they're experiencing it now. Cause when I can do that, they're going to have a, I can have a greater understanding of what they might be going through and then I can effectively help them a little bit better or coach them or lead them a little bit better. It's the same thing, like, like talking to our children, like, and I know I make this mistake all the time is I'm going to say, Hey, this is what I did when I was younger. Like they're, that's not going to work for them, right? That's not going to, they're not going to understand that. And why should they, right? It's, they don't have the mental capacity to understand that. They don't have the perspectives to be able to understand that. So how can I become a better parent? And again, I'm working on this. I need to be able to see things, how they're going through things. I need to be able to look at the world and the environment, how they're looking at things. And that's part of being right emotionally aware of myself, but then also having the social awareness to understand like what it is that they're going through. Like I didn't grow up uh, around social media, but the athletes I work with and the kids that I'm raising are. So how can I better understand all of the things around them, the stressors that are being placed around them to best help them and best lead them. Does that kind of make sense? For sure. And this actually kind of leads me into my next question or the thing that I want to talk about, which was, and I'm going to use this specific example because I know a lot of baseball players listen to this, but this goes for any injury that somebody has, or I don't know if, if, if you let get let go from a job or if you it could be anything, right? But using in sports injuries as a specific example, uh, because like you said, not everybody shares the same mindset. Uh, if 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 a player gets, if a pitcher gets Tommy John surgery, the way that we think about it is this gives you an opportunity to work on something that could not have been worked on before. And you see a lot of players come back stronger, better, faster, mm-hmm. all this stuff. For the most part, and we've had players on this show who have gotten Tommy John, like Tyler Glass now, and they kind of understand that. And that's how I like to think about it too. But then you have other people, and I won't name names, but they've gotten injured. And I I had asked this one question about like when when you see your all-star jersey on the wall, it should, again, thinking how we think, it should serve as a good reminder that that is potentially attainable and can happen again. But if you're down in the dumps, because everybody goes through the ups and the downs, Mm. you could look at that same Jersey and be like, man, I'm never going to get there again. Mm -hmm. Like I I was once there. I got a long road back. I don't know if I could do this, you know? So, um, just kind of go into that because then people have those backgrounds in the history of, well, it's not as easy as you think, but, but again, using kind of that Tommy John, example yeah it's it's setbacks like the way like you you described an injury like a tommy john like it's a setback and the way i would look at it is setbacks are temporary right or or the things that i'll often say to athletes is like hey you might have had a bad moment right now but that doesn't define your day right the bad moment does not define your day and a bad day doesn't define your week and a bad week doesn't define your month right like so it's a simple shift in perspective that hopefully I, you can share and that I can share with others to get them to realize like, Hey, like, like this stinks right now. And you know, this hurts right now. Like you're not able to be with your team or you're not be able to perform. You're not gonna be able to do this, but there's something else that you can do, right? There's always something you can do. 
right? And so we want to make sure we can try to create that shift in their own mindset of getting them to understand, hey, let's not get caught up in the things that we can't do. Let's think about the things that we can do. And when you start to develop, you know, you start to shift your perspective and things that you can do, let's start to recognize those wins. Let's start to recognize those efforts. Let's start to stack them on top of each other. Let's try to create a little bit of momentum. And then let's try to create, let that momentum carry into your rehab or carry into the training that you can do or carry into like, like, let's maybe use this opportunity to learn a new skill. Maybe you're not a good cook. Let's, let's, let's try to wait, develop ways that we can try to cook. Let's, or maybe journaling isn't your thing. Maybe we can try to apply that to journaling or reading, whatever it may be. Let's see if we can use your energy because you can't play with your team or you can't perform the way you want to. You still have energy. Let's make sure we can try to shift that energy into something productive. And the only way that's going to happen is if you can be present focused, right? Like, so those are like time periods, right? If you look up at the jersey on the wall and you say, oh man, I don't know if I can get back to that. Well, you're never going to get back to that because that happened in the past right? That, that, was, that was in the past. So you're never going to get back to that. It's like the thing like, oh, the defending champs. Like, what, what was that mean? You were a champion last year. Every every year, a team is different. It's constructed differently. There's, uh, even if you have the same players, like their mileage on their bodies is a little bit different. Maybe you brought in a new player, a new recruit, whatever it may be. Like, it's a different team. Every year, it's different. And every day is different. And so you can try to create, a little, enlighten that athlete or enlighten that individual to get them to understand, hey, you may not be able to do that because it's done in the past, but you never know if you can do it again. And if you want to do it again, you got to focus on right now because the only time, the only moment in time that you can ever control is the present. So let's be present focused with what it is that we're doing right now. Let's be present focused with our energy, our efforts, our enthusiasm. Um, if you're with other people, can you encourage them? Like being engaged, like all those, those are all letter E words, but they're important parts of understanding like our, our spirit, right? And so that's our that's our spirit that we can really be in control of. And when people can start to become or individuals can be start to become a little bit more aware of their spirit and the things that they can do, it can directly impact the efforts that they do physically and mentally. Right. So it's 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 really it's just kind of sharing that perspective. Yeah, yeah, no, and and the fact that you just shared it uh, with all of us right now is huge because I wish that's something that I knew at the time of that discussion because I think it would have shifted my perspective on <laughs> on that. And uh, I'm learning right now. I'm, I'm getting better right now. And there's one word that stuck out to me as you're speaking, which was "can" versus "can't." Right. So it's it's mm -hmm. uh, your 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 dialogue. Right. You can't you can't do this. You can do this. However, uh, I'm huge on. I get to do this rather than have to do this, you know, yep. just little, little tiny things that take zero effort, but that change of dialogue, boom, next thing you know, all right, you got that optimistic mindset. So that being said, something that you have that is, is your motto and something that I've taken from your weight room and I apply every single time I leave a ballpark, every single time I'm done with the workout, I'll tap the screen and, and make sure that it's like on this right here. Uh, after we record, but your your get better mindset, where did that evolve from? And and I mean, how powerful has it been? Just those kind of phrases that you have every single day, because this is my third John Gordon reference, but he's got the word of the year, which every day he uh, he just reminds himself of a word of a word. So then that way he just constantly has this like if it's courage, right? Every day, be be courageous. Um and I kind of like to think too, wow, we really do have a lot of similarities because I'm thinking that like keep swinging so many times I say it, maybe a hundred times in my head a day. And it reminds me of the consistency. But for you using get better, talk about the beginnings for that and uh, and and how powerful it's proven to be for you in the consistency type of realm. Yeah, I, you know, that's the sign that we have. I just got better. It's, you know, I, I stole it from Jeff Oliver, Holy Cross, where I worked for four and a half years. And he's a big one of my mentors, but it was up in that weight room and the athletes would slap it every single day. And um, I saw the habits that were, that's been, that was, that were being created just by athletes doing those things. And even sometimes athletes would come in and they would just even, they wouldn't even train. They just have a conversation with us. They would still hit it on their way out, you know? So that was, it became a part of who they were and their fabric and their identity. And I knew that when I got to Quinnipiac and I was fortunate enough to be able to start the program up from scratch, like that was one thing that, 
that I wanted to get everybody to understand is that they had an opportunity to try to improve. They had an opportunity to get better. Um, they had an opportunity to, to be coached. They, they had all these things that they get to do. And, um, you know, initially when we didn't really have much of a budget, like I just printed it out, right. I printed it out on a piece of paper and it, it was just up there. And I said, I just got better. And I told them like, every time you leave, you got to hit that sign. And I explained it and I defined it. And I, and I, um, try to get them to understand that their direct actions, their direct attitudes, their mindset, and all those types of things um, played a part if they were going to get better or not. Like I, to this day, I talk to recruits and I tell them flat out, like you got an opportunity to get better every single time you come in. Um, but if you have the attitude and mindset, like, oh, I don't like this drill or I'm tired today. I don't like that exercise. That, then you're never going to get better, right? You've already, you're already telling yourself that you're not going to put forth the effort because you don't like to do it or you feel a certain way. And I try to create the correlations. Like if you're going to go play the number one team in the country, are you going to step on the ice or step on the court, step on the field and say like, Oh, I hope, I hope we don't get blown out today. <laughs> or I'm going to step up to the play. I'm going to step up to the play. I'm going to play. I'm going to face an all-star pitcher. Like, Oh, I hope I don't strike out. Well, guess what happens as soon as you say those words, because your body hears what your mind says, you've planted a seed of doubt. And when you planted that seed of doubt, it's like going into an exam. I use this analogy too, is, is if you're questioning your preparation or you're questioning your confidence, then you're already going to fail. And so what I want them to get them to understand is like the opportunities and the moments you have to get better um, or directly it, it's on you and it's the attitudes and mindsets you come in, but also it's going to have a direct correlation to the efforts that you put forth. And so getting them to understand um, you know, that I get to have, I get to improve right now, like is massively important for their own development, but also their own personal growth, but also developing that confidence that they can do anything that they can do. Like what I say before, right? Leadership is the ability to positively influence others to do what they didn't think that they could do on their own. So you're trying to get them to understand that they are in control of everything it is that they want to accomplish and getting them to understand that you hitting a simple sign yeah, like that, that's a win, right? And we talk about like, we want to stack wins on top of each other. That's a small thing. You did a pull up and you yep. couldn't do a pull up before. Hey, I'm going to recognize that effort. You did something you couldn't do before. You did a push up for the first time. I'm going to recognize that effort. And then, because I know if I'm in the gym with other people, if me and you are in the gym right now and you say, come on, B, you got this, I'm going to go a little bit harder because you're encouraging me. And what are you doing? You're giving your own energy to me and I'm going to apply that. I'm like, man, I can't let him down. Right. Because because he wants me to win, too. So I'm going to want him to win. So I'm going to give it right back to him. And then it becomes contagious. And that get better attitude becomes contagious as a group. And then, man, when everybody's rowing that rowing the boat in the same direction. So that's when positive thing can happen. Um, but even on the outside of, of our room, it says be responsible for the energy you bring into the space. So when everybody knows, like, if you hey, don't bring any bad mojo in here, you got negative energy, like check it outside, like because that's not going to help us get better. So yeah. um, that's, it's, you know what, like talking about all these things and, you know, being at the place I am for 15 years and it's impressive and it's, um it's kind of cool to take a step back in that a lot, a lot of student athletes have been able to um, apply these things, these messages, these words and make it their own, you know, and then seeing them have, you know, success later on in their careers. Like we talked about Devon, but I'm, I'm like, I'm talking about so many student athletes that will, you know, send a message or send a note or send a DM or, you know, when I see them in person on come back to campus, like the positive influence that, um, that I've been able to make, but also just the, the things that they, that they actually took the time to get better at has made a difference in their own lives. Like, and I'll tell them flat out, like, listen, it's not me. I am just a guide or I'm just, I'm fortunate to be on your own journey. It's you take the, you decided to actually want to listen to me, you know? And so you deserve all the credit and getting them to let them know that they did all the work. They were willing to learn. Um, yeah. I just, I just have things to share, you know, and it's just, I have perspectives and insights to share. And um, I've been fortunate that a lot of people want to be able to listen to me. <laughs> Yeah, and dude, I can't tell you how much even just listening to you, I'm I'm thinking about so many names that are going through my head. Whether it's uh, our boys James Feldine, Justin Ruddy, yeah. the Baker boys, Sean Light, Kevin Tarka, Steve oh Robinson, God, I I could go on for days. But the it, it's like 
we still feel like we were at Quinnipiac yesterday, which uh, and we're still all good friends. And it, it just kind of goes to show how much of that team camaraderie, some of the things that they learned back then and that we've all learned just through you, like stick with us even well after graduating college. And 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 I do want to say, too, that that you, you had mentioned something about like uh, the type of attitude that you can have. Right. Uh, where it, it, it goes into. Um, oh man, I got to face this pitcher. I got to face this thing. Or in this case, if it's a center going up against another center, if somebody's on your team and they're like, oh man, I got to go up against the all-star, like I'm nervous. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? That all-star is also probably nervous. You know, <laughs> both of you are probably nervous. So just throw all that stuff out the window, lean into the fear and then just, yes. just, just go after it. You know what I mean? Um, so there's always that other side. And the pitcher example that you gave, well, maybe as the batter, if you're nervous, maybe the pitcher's nervous because you hit 30 home runs and he doesn't want to give up a tank to you. So <laughs> it goes both ways. So just throw it all out the window. But um, the the last thing that I want to say too, oh wait, one more thing, sorry. Uh, I mean, I'd get mad if I, if I left this out, but you said something about everybody rowing the boat. I love when people ask me, why did you just tap the blank wall as we're like leaving the dugout or somewhere yeah. in the stadium? And then I get the opportunity to tell them and share them. And then next thing you know, I'm like, I look at them and be like, man, because we just got better, baby. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> and then they're smiling. And then they get all pumped up. And it's just, just such a feel-good feeling. So everything that you just said has been amazing. We are super appreciative of your time. And I want everybody to be able to follow your journey, get some more uh, insight and tips and just, just how to get better in general. And uh, so just let us know where everybody could follow you on social media and also how they could grab your podcast on all the different platforms, because I'm sure a lot of people want a lot more Coach B after this. Well, yeah, it's I think we had a great conversation today. And if anybody does want to learn more about me, follow me. They just you can go to my website, CoachBPatel.com. Um, there, there's it's almost like a massive brain dump I had during COVID. It's trying to essentially put everything, every article, every podcast that I had done, all into one place. Um, put out information about like what my philosophy is, the things that I've done, articles I've written all in one area. Uh, all my links to socials are there, Instagram, Twitter. Um, you know, I do a weekly podcast with the Meta Athletes, um, you know, NFT project, but really it's it's basically, it's, it's a business, right? It, and it's unfortunate to be a part of that team and trying to help and influence other people positively to try to impact them, their own lives in, in the best way that they can and try to help them win in life. And so that's a weekly podcast that we'll do. Um, and then, yeah, just everything on socials can be found there. So coachbpadel.com is probably the one-stop shop. And then um, if you're ever interested or anybody wants consults and things, just direct message from there, send an email, and, and we'll try to help as best as I can. My man, Coach B. Brzez Patel, thank you so much for hopping on Q Swing, man. I'm, I'm pumped. I've been smiling this entire time. This is awesome. I appreciate it. Awesome. Matt. This was awesome. This was a lot of fun, um, great insights. And I, you are somebody that I – admire from afar like just seeing your your path and your career like you're actually killing it and um just know that you are a positive influence on everybody that you're able to impact as well too so keep swinging my man